to the July 6, 2020 edition of Cafe Muse Online. We have quite a storm brewing up here in Washington. So we've had a little difficulty getting people in and out of the, uh, uh, the environment here, but I think we're ready to roll. Uh, I am Henry Crawford, and tonight I'll be co-hosting this evening with Renee Garrity and Susan Oakey. Before I begin, I want to thank the WordWorks, everyone on the Cafe Muse team, and every one of you for joining us here tonight. Tonight, we are pleased to present Tracy Brimhall and Borgie Zenhuizen. In a few minutes, Renee will introduce Tracy, and after that, you will hear from Susan, who will introduce Borgie Zenhuizen. So let's get a few housekeeping things out of the way right now. First, and most importantly, if you want to support our poetry reading series or purchase the books of these poets, please click on the green button below and you'll be directed to a site where you can easily make a donation to the series or purchase the poets' books. If you'd like to see more information about the poets, just click on the tab in the upper left that says Tracy Brimhall and Borgi Zenhuizen. And of course, if you'd like to follow all of our WordWorks readings, please click on the follow tab in the upper right hand corner of your screen. If you want to ask a question of our poets, and here we truly uh, encourage the asking of questions, uh, you can click on the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. And you can read other people's questions and you can vote on the ones that you want to hear most. We'll try to get to as many of these as time permits after the uh, poets performances. Uh, and of course, please make use of the lively chat feature that you see over there to comment on the performances while they're going on. Um, very often what we find in these programs, people will, uh, a line will excite them or intrigue them and then they will put that into the chat. And uh, don't be afraid of saying, wow, because yeah. I'm sure we're gonna hear some of that tonight. A um, Couple more things. Please join us this Monday, August 3rd, uh, 2020, when um, on Monday, August 23rd, 2020, when the WordWorks will present the DC Area Liter Literary Translators Network, that is DC Alt, with poet translators Andrea Georgievic and M Seth Michelson, who will be introduced by our own Barbara Goldberg. And please come back for our next Poets versus the Pandemic series on Wednesday, July 15, 2020, which will feature yours truly, Henry Crawford, and I'll be reading from my new book, The Binary Planet. Finally, please remember, if you want to come back to this reading, just click on the same link that you used to get here. The reading will be archived permanently at this URL. And let me bring on to the uh, Crowdcast stage our co-host, Renee Garrity. Thank you, Henry, and good evening, everyone. Welcome. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing our first poet, Tracy Brimhall. Tracy is an associate professor and director of creating writing at Kansas State University. She has a bachelor's from Florida State University, a master's from Sarah Lawrence College, and a PhD from Western Michigan University. She's the author of four collections, Rookery, Our Lady of the Ruins, which was, by the way, selected by Carolyn Forche for the Bernard Women Poets Prize, Sodad, and her most recent book, Come the Slumberless to the Land of Nod. It's almost easier to say what journals her poems haven't been published in and what honors she hasn't received. I'll name a few, but you'll have to visit her website for the others. Her poems have appeared in The New Yorker, Poetry, Plowshares, Prairie Schooner, and Copper Nickel, to name a few. She's received the National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship in Poetry, scholarships to the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and the Writers Center. In Come to the Slumberless, to the Nod, <laughs> to the Land of Nod, you'll find very personal poems that also touch something familiar in the reader. She writes of love, the birth of a child, divorce, the death of her mother, and her poems balance each other in their opposites, life and death, tenderness and brutality, myth and reality. You'll find lullabies, letters, and love poems. You'll have interesting encounters with biblical and mythical references, sensuality, Egyptian gods, animals, bullet casings, and sonograms. She often uses repetition 
and does so in a way that the lines flow from one to another in an easy rhythm. You know the repetition is there, but it doesn't seem forced. Um, in her poem, How to Write a Love Poem Without Hyperbole, she writes, I like to kiss you with tongue, with gusto, with socks still on. I love you like a vulture loves a careless deer on the roadside. I want to get all up in you. I love you like Isis loved Osiris. In those four lines alone, you have the flow of rhythm and the interesting encounters and, um, and the uh, mythical figures. Her imagination will take you to ideas you never thought of. For example, she describes her love as being the way pawns in a chess love aristocratic horses. I just love that. And asks what better way to describe how crazy we are when we first fall in love. And she says, her love is so crazy, she would throw herself in front of a bishop or a queen for you. Like her bio, there's so much more to say about her poems. So take a listen and let her tell you firsthand. Please join me in welcoming Tracy Brimhall. Thank you. And I love, thank you everyone too, who's um, leaving comments so we can kind of see who's here because we can't see, see you the way we could if there was an audience. So it's lovely to see you there. I'm so grateful. Somebody already said, thank you so much for creating this event. And I am so glad too that, you know, despite all of us having to learn, you know, new technology um, and not being able to interact in that more personally intimate way that we still get to in these pandemic times, get to connect over language. Um, and as you can see, I'm sitting outside. It is sunny where I am. I don't have the, the storm issue. So I am glad since my Wi-Fi is outdoors <laughs> that I didn't have the same weather as everyone else back in D.C., though I do miss that I'm not there in person. Um, so the poem I had planned to start out with that I have open right now is actually um, the one that you all have already heard a bunch of uh, lines from, um, but now you'll get to hear them in a different order um, and the ending uh, will still be a surprise, I hope. Um, and the one thing that I often like to um, put uh, or share before I read the poem um, is um, about Isis and Osiris. So Osiris is a very famous um, Egyptian god, um, and part of the fame of his story is that uh, his brother Set murdered him and chopped him up into anywhere from 13 to 42 pieces, but 42 is a very common number, and scattered them about the kingdom. Um, his wife and sister, uh, that part's a little weird, but it's okay. It was ancient Greek gods, that's how they did it, or Egyptian gods. She collected parts of his body and reassembled him and breathed life back into him. Um, but she was missing one part, the part she needed to conceive her son Horus, um, which some say she fashioned out of gold or something else. But there is a, um, a line that suggests, says something about the missing part. Um, and that's basically, I'm starting my reading off with a very long and elaborate penis joke. Um, but anyway, this is the uh, full version of Love Poem Without a Drop of Hyperbole. I love you like ladybugs love windowsills. Love you like sperm whales love squid. There's no depth I wouldn't follow you through. I love you like the pawns and chess love aristocratic horses. I'll throw myself in front of a bishop or a queen for you, even a sentient castle. My love is crazy like that. I like that sweet little hothouse mouth you have. I like to kiss you with tongue, with gusto, with socks still on. I love you like the vulture loves the careless deer at the roadside. I want to get all up in you. I love you like Isis loved Osiris, but her devotion came up a few inches short. I'd train my breath and learn to read sonar until I retrieved every lost blood vessel of you. I swear this love is ungodly, not an ounce of suffering in it. Like salmon with its upstream itch, I'll dodge grizzlies for you. Like hawks and to skyscraper rooftops, I'll keep coming back. Maddened, a little hopeless, embarrassingly in love. And that's why I'm on the couch, kissing pictures on my phone, instead of calling you in from the kitchen, where you were undoubtedly making dinner too spicy. But when you hold the spoon to my lips and ask if it's ready, I'll say it is, always, but never, there is never enough. So there's my very elaborate dick joke that I put into a poem. Um, 
And as was mentioned, uh, the, the book does have a lot of love. There's a lot of darkness in it too. And just as I mentioned with, you know, the, the murder of Osiris in that poem, um, you know, there's a murder at the heart of this book um, when one of my friends was murdered. But the other thing um, that it does have, I say it's all murder ballads and lullabies um, because I, my son was born um, I was watching my friend's murder trial um, before my son was born. So all of his, his three murderers were um, going on uh, with a trial um, at the time my son was born. So I, I wrote a lot of lullabies, really desperately trying to still create poems um, as a new mother um, and while I was pregnant as well. But there's constantly a tension for me between that, that life and death moment. So here's one of the lullabies from the book, um, the book that was mentioned of Come the Slumberless to the Land of Nod. Lullaby on Mount Moriah. Um, and I suppose the helpful thing to know at this one is that Mount Moriah is where um, Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice him for, um, as was requested by God. Um, so uh, Mount Moriah um, is, is the Mount Moriah of the title. Lullaby on Mount Moriah. The lullaby I wrote on your throat about the stained hilt of the knife in my hand begins, whisper, or snow will come and make its sadness famous in your mouth. The why of you, a radiant devilfish. The what of you, a fat little soul bluing at the edges. The surest way to receive a free ram is to tie your son's hands behind his back. Offer me a metaphor, God said. Abraham stretched Isaac out on a rock like this, do not be impatient with a gift. It will bleed out in the time it takes shadows and atoms to inch their way between the stars. Every fire thinks it's a part of God, but lightning is not a promise. A flag is not a shield. Love wants you to believe that somewhere there's a God that can do your dying for you. There are raptures that won't come for you and raptures that will. In between, satellites blink news to the lights in our hands. Love will teach you many things, many of them tragic. Like last kisses and letters under your window sh win windshield. Like helplessness. Like the man on the news weeping and carrying what remains of his son in a plastic bag. And Abraham says, this is how much I loved you. And measures Isaac from ankle to scalp. Love will gut you and then ask you to carry on singing with light on your tongue. As a father finds flies crowning his son's dreamless head, radiant as the hand of God ushering a late sheep from the bushes. So the title um, is a very Baroque and somewhat cumbersome title of a book, Come the Slumberless to the Land of Nod. Um, I'm aware that's super mega long, um, but one of the things that really struck me was that Nod um, is the place where um, after Cain kills Abel, he is exiled to the land of Nod. Um, but I also knew this uh, poem as a child um, that, uh, has wink and blink and nod and they're these three brothers and when they sleep and dream their boat turns into a ship and so I found it quite odd that like one place could be both the place of um, exile and condemned murderers as well as this land of sleep and dream. So the title you know come the slumberless to the land of nod sort of comes from this this tension between how can a place be both um, you know these two things this place of exile um, and murder, as well as the place of innocence in childhood and dream. Um, so that's sort of the origin. And so I just read one of the lullabies. Um, and the murder ballads in the piece are all essays um, sprinkled into the book. Um, so I, I don't want to take up the time of reading um, an essay, but I thought I would read one of the poems sort of based off of my friend's murder. Um, so it's called How to Sugar for the Atlas, um, which is an atlas moth. Um, so, and the instructions are legit instructions. You can also Google for a sun, summer activity, um, sugaring for moths, and you too can paint tree bark with like stale beer and mashed bananas and stuff. Um, and it will get moths to come to that place. Um, and especially with the connection between moths and butterflies and visitations from the dead, um, that's part of what sparked this poem. Um, so this poem is called How to Sugar for the Atlas. Begin first with the intent to lure a bright species. The luna with its lichen glow, or the cloudless sulfur with its daffodil flutter. Ask the moon for the garnet symmetry of the atlas, with its wing powder like ash or the wrong snow. 
Create the temptation. Brown sugar, stale beer, molasses, blackened bananas. Ratios aren't important, but apply to bark with paintbrushes while singing murder ballads until your trees reek with sweetness. Coat them at dusk and wait for dark. Watch for souls returning with furred faces and nocturnal hungers approaching from arctic latitudes. Yes, call his name when the first one arrives. Don't be surprised he doesn't recognize you. Watch him dip his proboscis with tender amnesia in the bait. Don't be surprised when you decide to keep him, this creature with spiracles that claims not to know you. Bag and freeze him. Give him a gentle second death. Slow his panic to dull flaps. Help him relax enough for saving. This is another immortality, you can say, as you pin and label him with careful ink. This is the kind of cruel others will understand. You want him whole again. Not like his first death when police found him and thought he was moving. How he looked dressed for the night before flies rose from his body, holding the shape of him midair, a shadow with a thousand wings, and then a prayer. So I, um, somebody recently asked, how did I get the idea um, to put essays in a book of poems? Um, and I don't actually remember how it arrived as an idea, um, but I do know that every time I write a book or get to that stage, I am looking to figure out um, what rule can I break? What do I think is forbidden to me? And often that's true of when I sit down to write poems too. I try and think of what have I not done before or what do I feel like I'm not allowed to do and sort of try and um, push into those spaces of like, what haven't I, you know, what do I feel is forbidden? Um, and a trick, um, this is a little side detour here from the poems, but I will come back. Um, one of the things I have uh, done sometimes is I write, uh, and I suggest this, like a fake five-year bio. Like in five years, what do I want to, to say about my poems or my work or um, where it's even been published? Because I've noticed that sometimes places I want to be aren't places I'm sending. Um, but to sort of clarify my own desires for myself, I try and write into this you know, write this fake bio to sort of understand. And sometimes that helps me figure out like, oh, I feel like I'm not allowed to do that. Or if I could have a fantasy, my fantasy is that I could do X, Y, or Z in a poem. Um, and that sort of helps me clarify my, what I might want to do. Um, all right, so to try and lighten up a little bit from uh, murder, um, this is a family portrait. Everyone has been very interested in writing self-portraits. Um, people write about obviously about the self in poems, I is a, a big deal here. Um, but I, I wrote a few family portraits for the book as well. Um, so hopefully this is a little bit uh, light of a transition out of a, a murder poem. So this is family portrait as lullaby. Your father is the slow dance and I am the ballad. Or he's the nightclub and I am the six tequila shots on the bar. I am the salt and lemon too. I am the snake and the apple. I am the tongue that says to your father, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Your father, the monologue in the music box, and I, the plastic ballerina in gold shoes. Your father is the swaddle, the rock, the cradle. His pot-bellied heart loses its socks and learns to laugh. You are Mars. Your father and I are two moons orbiting. You, stardust on the telescope lens, the ice in the comet's tail. Your heart is a poppy, bright and forgetful. You are the first May apple of spring, unripe and rising. And this is the hallelujah I asked the first star to sing at the quickening. This is the dirty Eden, stalked by envious angels. This is the land of Isaac and of knives. We are the wish imperfectly granted, and this is the well. All right, so um, I'm glad I could read a couple of happy things tonight and I'll try and you know come back up. But uh, the two other things that happened um, during the course of writing the book, I mentioned um, my son being born um, at the same time my friend's murder trials was going on and my mom died um, a few months later. Um, and for, for that reason and lots of other reasons also, I ended up getting a divorce shortly after two. Um, so I was like, oh good, one more tragedy to toss into a book, perfect. Um, 
so uh, there, there's a, you know, a couple more sad waves in the book uh, of difficult things. Um, but the one I want to read now is, is a little bit longer, um, but it is called Vive Vive, which is Latin for live, live, um, which is important maybe to kind of remember for the ending uh, of the poem as well, since it's a little bit longer. Um, but the title again is Vive Vive, um, which is a commandment to live. Last night, I slipped my finger in the milkweed, my hand doing the wind's work. It was so soft, that crooked slit aching open, but not far enough for those white tufts to float away. I couldn't help myself, and I didn't want to. I wanted to tease out those stubborn seeds and make them leave like they're supposed to. Stupid little futures hiding from flight. A friend tells me she had a dream about me holding an arm full of apples in a treeless field. Write a poem about it, she says. Call it Come What May. I want to call it My Joys Are Selfish Whores and Suck the Worm from a Red Delicious, but wasn't I good once? Didn't I play penitent with a floral sheet bobby pinned to my girlish curls as I rocked the doll's plastic lips to my flat chest and called it the Lord's? What now? Lowly animal, I've pitied myself like any mammal that hurts. I've described the papier on a cat's tongue to my son. How that wet sandpaper that cleans our salty fingers is a predator's tenderness, the tongue evolving into a tool to lick bones clean. None of my prayers are questions anymore, just aching stanzas full of chrysanthemums dying on the kitchen table. At our anniversary dinner, my husband and I agreed we wouldn't talk about pain. No new medications, no dosages, no metaphors for what's failing in his body now or how this new pill will make him die for trying not to suffer. He had the pork. I had the balsamic glazed duck. There was apple tort and coffee at the end. The sun set. We said nothing. There was no language without sorrow in it, that terrible near symmetry. I set out my nativity two months early. I always confused Joseph with the shepherds, but there's no mistaking Mary and her silent baby staring up at the bored sheep. I paint her robe with a nail polish called Starter Wife. My Lord, why is goodness so hard for me? I lick a battery to feel a spark before putting it in the toy ambulance. Dead, I think, my tongue unjolted. At least now I won't have to hear the sirens wailing their false emergencies after my son loads the swaddled baby Jesus in the back. My husband is in his room again where he goes to be alone with his suffering. I think of my wedding, of the sky that day, the hope I had, the shame of it now. Our old cat paws at the back door, hissing at something beyond the gate, growling at what only he can see in the dark. I hiss at him. I want him to know danger is coming from both sides. You can't even trust what you love. He claws at the glass anyway, as if there was any fight left in him, as if this meanness isn't what we all do when we know how helpless we are. God, God, what do I do after all this survival? Another friend dreamt of me saying, I can't bear it anymore, and sprouting glass feathers from my shoulders and arms. She said the dream wasn't windy, but they fluttered as if they weren't glass. Even in dreams, I'm flightless, incapable of escaping. My prayers return as a knife and a commandment I carve into the skin of an apple, gentle with the flesh, gentler with the blade, before I suck the sweetness from each of the wounds I made. Okay, and then I'm going to go happy so that I don't have to leave you with um, a bummer of uh, a sad ending. Um, so the last poem I'll read is called Contender. Um, as I always have a thing that you need to know about a poem, and I apologize for that. But often research or fun facts um, is really generative for me, and I really like um, learning um, weird things. Um, and often I just like save them, or I know someday I'm gonna use that um, in a poem. And uh, in this one, it was the fact of Secretariat's heart, which I never thought I would put in a poem. So if you don't know who Secretariat is, I also don't watch horse racing, but I may heard this fact one day that the very famous racehorse secretariat who won the triple crown um so 
people might know of the very sad ending that horses often have. But if you are a famous horse that wins the Triple Crown, you get to be buried whole. Um, you aren't used for other things um, and you, after your death. Um, so famous horses get um, this dissection done at the end. And in this case, when they were figuring out, uh, when examining Secretariat after his death, they realized he had this very genetically enlarged heart. Um, and I just started remembering that I should share that the, the quote I read that the um, veterinarian who is performing this uh, necropsy said, um, it is actually a quote. And I just sort of love that, that that's what he actually shouted out this thing in the middle of examining this, heart, this overly large heart in this horse. Um, and I just think that's kind of fun to know because I'm a person who really likes facts. Um, I think facts are a form of intimacy with the world and they often sneak into my poems. So it's called Contender. It's all right to overdress for the riot. Your rage is stunning. It's all right to pursue the wrong pleasures and the right suffering. Here's my permission, take it. It's all right to replace a siren with a bell. Let the emergency make some music. It's all right that the meter reader broke your sunflower in half. You knew better than to plant it where you did. Sometimes it's all right if you call your waiter honey when you order sweet tea. It's all right if you fall out of love with being alive, but try again tomorrow with French pop songs and fresh croissants. Wear all your gold to church and try, really try, to believe anything but a stethoscope can hear your heart's urgency. It's all right that your mother died. So will your father and your son, but hopefully not before you. It's all right to lay naked in the rain and refuse to go inside even when the moon tries to make your cold thighs shine. It's okay to lick the ice cream cake from your fingers. Do it now in front of everyone. And if what falls on the children lining up their cars for the soapbox derby is not snow but ash, that's all right. Celebrate the mutable body. And if you write notes to friends and senators in primary colors, it's fine. It's even okay to begrudge the stubborn pears in the wooden bowl. You're right, you know. They're waiting to yellow until you turn away. It's all right that in the economy of forgiveness, you keep coming up one daffodil short. It's all right if you ask your heart to grow the size of secretariats, not because you want to outrun other horses or because your legs are classic, but because you too want to be buried whole after someone examines the insensible engine you left behind. I am of the beloved's name, no longer metronoming the valves, and places that slick fist in a stainless tray for weighing and shouts, sweet Jesus, before describing its ungodly heft with superlatives. Your heart, the most tireless, wildest, wiliest, thirstiest heat on record. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm really looking forward to hearing Borgie's poems and seeing if y'all have any questions later. Um, and thank you again to everybody at Cafe Muse for inviting me to be a part of this night. Thank you so much, uh, Tracy. That was one heck of a beautiful reading. And if you look at the comments there, uh, you know, it was, I think Karen said that you've given us a, a workshop and a reading. So uh, uh, thank you so much. And uh, well, we'll catch up later. And 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 I say this to our reader, uh, our audience as well. Feel free to ask some questions in the uh, in the question uh, area there. And so we'll see you a little later on on in that okay. thing. But just a wonderful reading. Thank you so much. Thanks, Henry. Okay, so let me bring on um, Susan Oki, and uh, who will be our next. Okay, and I got to invite her to the screen here, please. Bear with me as I uh, do this. Okay. And there she is. Susan Oki, ready to introduce our next uh, poet, Borgi Zenhuizen. Hello, everybody. What a stunning reading. I so enjoyed that. Uh, I'm very pleased and proud to be here to introduce my friend and, and uh, fellow poet, Borgi Zenhuizen. And without further ado, I keep leaving from where I left without arriving, writes Borgi Zenhuizen in the poem, I can't translate my origins, placed near the beginning of her prize-winning chapbook, Behind Normalcy. From its first pages, this debut collection gradually reveals its speaker, a cross-cultural transplant, formed by her childhood in Switzerland, fluent in multiple languages and literatures, 
quite literally emerging from behind the mask in her adopted country to give voice to her story and her sensibility. Sennheiser's metaphors range widely, drawing from the natural world or the urban landscape, but also from haunting childhood memories like that of her grandmother, stirring polenta or teaching the grandchildren to gather windfall apples for drying or making schnapps. In crafting her spare, meticulous poems, Sennheiser focuses not only on familiar issues such as word choice and line breaks, but attends to the poem's shape on the page and how its structure leads a reader's eye. Form often mimes emotional content, as in Breakfast on a School Day, a poem in which the speaker's train of thought shuttles back and forth between getting her child out the door for school and reacting to a shocking newspaper image of a photographer shot in a war zone. Poet Molly Spencer, who's here tonight, writes, these poems shimmer with the commonplace, an apple shifting in the bowl, a rubber glove, the bus stop, a plastic shopping bag blown in the wind. Ordinary moments are made to gleam by the poet's clean attention, formal daring, and quietly startling images to remind us that the ordinary is only ordinary if we don't look closely. Sennheusen grew up in Switzerland where she majored in English and Spanish literature and linguistics at the University of Basel. After relocating to the DC area, she studied poetry at the Writers' Center in workshops led by Rose Solari, Jean Nordhaus, Laura Fargus, and Yvette Neisser. Behind Normalcy won the 2019 Harris Poetry Prize, chosen by poet Erica Dawson, and was published by City Lit Press last year. She co-edited the translations of the bilingual poetry anthology, Knocking on the Door of the White House, Zozobra Publishing, 2017 which was selected by Beltway Poetry Quarterly as a 2017 10 best book. Her writing appears in various print and online journals. Borgi lives in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and is an indispensable behind the screens co-host of the Cafe Muse Literary Salon. Please welcome poet Borgi Zenhuizen. Thank you so much, Susan. That was so nice. Um, and uh, thank you, Tracy, for your incredible reading. And I loved your comments and explanations. That was so special. I'm sure I will go back to it um, after our reading tonight. So, um, and thank you, Cafe Muse, for having me. And um, thank you, everybody, for being here and hearing me. This is also my very first reading in my life. Apart from some open mics, you know, here and there. And um, so Susan mentioned a poem, Staring Polenta, which is also the first in this chapbook. Um, and so um, there is something in Switzerland um, about origins. Your place of origin in Switzerland means... A special thing it's in your passport everybody knows it and it's not necessarily where you were born nor um, where you grew up it is the place your fathers and forefathers come from so it's a patrilineal thing in my case that place is in the Alps and we visited that place every summer um, because my grandma, my um, paternal grandparents were there. So here is to um, my foremothers in the Alps. Stirring polenta. Hand knit the socks of my childhood, sheep's sallow beige, rough and itchy, no giving them. Their fatty wool worked by our grandma from a hard thread spun by her sister-in-law, scratching the fingers of both. Each summer, leaving behind hearty stews, grandmas dug up potatoes and onions, our collected blueberries mixed into canned fruit, and her gorgeous bouquets of endangered flowers she picked regardless. We paid our great uncle's house a visit, stepped into the instantly blinding dimness 
of low ceilinged dining room ground old dust into unhewn boards, knots pressing into our souls. Our great aunt in her dark layers ensconced beside this cool soapstone of an idle oven, there must have been an exchange of words, shaking of hands, some more words between dad and his uncle, brief laughs at one of dad's jokes in the filtered afternoon sun, pallid through small and deep set windows, never a patch of it crossing her face. If she smiled, we wouldn't know nor how many a sharp retort her expert fingers spun into useful yarn, yarn for socks and gloves for all of us. Protection, not comfort. Soft treading from her corner, always. Her wheel, a steady whir. I still puzzle over the source of her light in what I remember to be a pitch dark aisle of a kitchen, window slit at its end, cast iron stove, sink of stone and a crate filled with potatoes or cones to start a fire. She must have known in her body each protrusion while slowly stirring a thickening polenta, bubbles lazily mouthing along the surface. Now to these origins, this is another um, poem Susan mentioned. And I say, I can't translate my origins. Sliver of slate at best bouncing across shimmer toward a bleeding horizon haze without distance closing in. I keep leaving from where I left without arriving. The shimmer keeps beckoning and so does the slim rock I weigh between forefingers and thumb I stand sideways, shift my weight and concentric circles mark its path and where it sinks then silence. The, um, I was crossing the Chesapeake Bay when I um, saw the horizon, you know, how it melts into the Atlantic there. So that's where the poem started. But of course, <laughs> that's just the image. So here, the next um, poem is called Borders. It's a poem you can read several ways. I will read two of them. Um, and each time I will say the title border again. So here is border. I say I can't translate my origins to say I belong, but I get to pilfer from generous helpings at the buffet's spread. I navigate wounds of this country, patience and curiosity, the only real border I face. Slowly unlearning you, safe I mean, from the threat of being perceived as one. Border. I say I can't translate, but I get to pilfer my origins from generous helpings to say I belong at the buffet's spread. I navigate patience and curiosity, wounds, the only real border of this country I face. 
slowly unsafe. I mean, learning from the threat of you being perceived as one. So you can read this even in a third way or even more. The way I wrote it, I don't know if you can see it, um, but it's blocks. So I like to play um, with um, layers. I like to play with um, direction, you know, horizontal up and down. And so, and I want the reader, I want to invite the reader to do their part, whatever that part is. They can do it. They, if you can do it, if you want to, you don't have to. It's up to you how much you read into it. So that's why the dedication of my book is to you, reader. You are a poem's lungs. Um, so my next poem uses a line by um, the poet Terry Ellen Cross Davis from her um, great collection, Hint. And um, it is from the poem Work Calendar and is about, her poem is about the private grief of, a, of a, the loss of a family member. And my poem is about a grief um, I cannot really fathom. Um, it's the loss of the, slain, of the many slain, murdered black people. Her line is, so her line is, your grief, a black ice, how I wish for snow. Now, each word of this line will end one of my lines. And my poem is called The Safety of Fear. I would my breath flickered your pain or what I deem to be yours and grief. Shuddering through the first few strokes, a morning swim, I slowly sink with the black tiled line of the slain, my guide on the ice blue leaf strewn floor, a hair weaving through my fingers, how chlorine burns contagion like silence into words. I swim in a swirl of neutralized secretions, purity a wish Full thought, softly splashing for fear, packed like old snow. And now I have to find where I'm going next. Oh, now we come to my dear son who is now 22, but in this poem he is um, about three or four. And he discovers that sadness is a thing and um, it's even a thing you can induce. And the, um, the speaker in this poem, the I, is a music box. So here is music box. My pin plucked offbeat melody in your small hands, blue canopy, gold-rimmed cresting you stroke the smooth of my white plastic miniature horses and golden rods fetching me from the shelf and turn the key to my sadness yet again what do you hear little boy riding up and down round and round i weep as you practice. And here is 
another one about him and it's called catch breached ears this morning fighting to unhear news of human bombs bullets his first tears for more than himself tears as slow to form as permanent teeth and I am bound to watch his wounded righteousness, wonderful catch in my web of gutted carcasses. Um, and now I get to the poem that is on the cover of the book. This cover is an image by, taken by a photographer friend of mine and it has very special meaning to me. And the um, part of the poem deals with this rubber glove. It's a short poem. And it, yeah, aren't we all very vulnerable when we have children? I mean, in it's a vulnerability and no no other actually so here it is rubber glove soft armor slough of the firm touch i've shared mine pink medium size limp shell of a grip out there translucent skin instead moist and shivering in the alien sun, I pray. And now I get to my last poem and I want to thank you all very much for being here and to Cafe Muse. This poem is for my husband and it's in the shape of a mango lying down. And um, mango is, uh, is this, um, spoken the same way in Spanish as in German. My husband is from Central America. So mango, in your tongue and in mine, not the hirsi of my home, cerezas in your dictionary I pick. Those twins and triplets, black pearls, weather split, toward the supple stems between my lips. The stone propelled a wide arc. What do you know? What do I of we can never be sure about we harvest our separate paths meandering alongside away toward do you remember our child suckling his first first right down to the pit juice dripping from his pointy chin onto his fat belly in his aunt's arms on the beach the fruit as big as his face. Skin spirals through my peeler, flesh slips through my fingers, morning gold at these still dark hours, long before our hopeful bites into the uncertain firmness of duraznos, firzich, peaches, mango on your tongue and mine, soft slivers expressed bye everybody thank you you're not going anywhere yet let's have a big round of cyber applause for borgi zenhoisen who just gave one uh, terrific beautiful and uh excellent reading and i am I, it's the first i knew that this was your first reading and so congratulations you did excellent let me see if we can get tracy uh Grimhall back here oh and she's going to bring the birds with her as well yes okay i was wondering if those birds were going to come back and there they are very good very this was uh 
our two poets, um, just wonderful applause uh, coming in, um, in, the, in, the, in the best ways that it can in these kind of environments. Uh, let's go to the end. We got a couple of questions. Let's see uh, what we have here. And, and feel free uh, to ask some questions using the question tab if you, if you would. Okay, so here is a, um, here is a question. I think that, oh, here's one that went for, for Bergie. Um, Borgie. Uh, some of your poems are elaborately shaped, Borgie, uh, including, <laughs> one, <laughs> including one that looks like half an apple and occupies two pages. At what point in your creative process does the shape come to you? And that question comes from our own Susan Oki. Um, it happens, yeah, sometimes very early, but it's usually... I don't sit down saying, oh, I'm going to write a poem in this and that shape. It's like I start and then all of a sudden, a few days later, for, to, through some serendipity or other, I go like, oh, like, I, this should be in that shape. But the mango maybe... Um, came about because I wrote an other poem that was a pom is a pomegranate. It's also in the book. And then I pro and I think I thought, oh, I need another fruit shaped poem. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it, it happens it's intuitively, let's put it that way. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Tracy, how about you? Do you take shape into account when you are uh, crafting your poems? Um, not quite as creatively as Borgi, um, but it is, uh, I do find, I like, I love Gregory Orr's Four Temperaments that says poets sort of superpower comes out of like narrative, imagination, form, or sound. Um, and I, for a long time, was a very narrative poet um, and really needed to reach into music. But then when I sort of started writing more from uh, a greater imaginative place, form became even more important because... I mean, imagination is great, but it can go on forever. And then every poem turns into a 30 page poem about a love song between a zombie unicorn and a sea serpent. I mean, it can just that limitlessness of of imagination um, needs some sort of external strictures. And so because I am a person who's a little bit too much uh, extra is an adjective that has been used about me before. Um, I, I like to use form to sort of sort of figure out, you know, what can I get rid of? Um, what is the watery syllable in this line? Um, how could I take a poem of this many lines and turn it into this many? Um, and so I, I like form for its restrictions, um, but I'm not quite as playful as Borgi in, in some of the, the forms that I come up with. Very good, very good. Uh, uh, Karen, uh, in the comment area, just posed a very interesting question that I'd like to see if the two of you could answer. And that is, what kind of questions do you find annoying to answer? Um, I haven't had yet one, I believe, that has annoyed me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> playing it safe. <laughs> who's your okay, favorite no? poet? Oh, who's your favorite word. poet? Oh, yeah, yeah. that's true. Oh. Though. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no. <laughs> or, yeah. or what's your right. poem? I'm like, I don't. I got a whole Bible full of poems. So I just like hand copy the things I love. I got lots of them. I don't know. How, how your favorite's about, hard. How about um, how did you start writing poetry? Is that a, is that one that you hear a lot of? But maybe that's not an annoying one. And especially, I like, you know, especially when it's young people too, I'm like, well, you know, they, they're sort of interested in their origin stories and I'm, I'm down with sharing an origin story. I wasn't bit by a radioactive spider, spider. and I wish that was like you know, my origin story. It's just like, I was sad and so I had feelings and put them in a journal. Um, but I think especially since that's my origin story, it resonates often when I visit, you know, undergrad classes or something and can make them feel like, yeah, I'm sad too. I write poems too. <laughs> and then they feel like that connection. So that that's... That's not too bad, but the favorite poet or poem one, I'm not a fan. <laughs> I agree. That's one, yeah. So don't okay. ask. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, Karen also has a, has a question in the question uh, area saying, uh, and I think this is directed towards Bergie, who had endangered flowers in her uh, poem. Is that, and uh, oh, she wonders what could they be? What they were, like, now I have to subtract a few decades. Um, when I was a kid. 
Um, oh. Enzian, I don't know how you call it's one of the national flowers uh, of Switzerland and the Edelweiss. Um, there are some uh, some flowers, yeah, but she didn't care. <laughs> My <laughs> grandma didn't care. She wanted, she was uh, in a way a cheerful person, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I think uh, that uh, sort of takes care of questions. Uh, and you guys have, uh, you can see in the uh, in the chat, the uh, stream of uh, complimentary and uh, insightful comments that are down there. Um, looks like I've been down in the analytics page. Looks like a, a, we have a couple of people who have, we, we've had good um, clicks over there to purchase the book and hopefully also donate to our cause. You can do that on the green um, tab. And if you're watching this in the replay, feel free again to purchase the books and to donate to our reading series. But with that, I think we're going to call it a night and uh, say goodbye to these two uh, very excellent poets who have uh, done just a magnificent job tonight. So uh, I'll say goodbye to you guys. And um, so long, especially from the library there. Take your birds with you, Ber <laughs> Tracy. So long. OK. All right, so please come back and join us on Monday, August 3rd, 2020, when the Word Works will present the DC Area Literary Translators Network, that's DC Alt, and poet translators, Andrea Jervik, uh, Seth Mike, and Seth Michelson, who will be uh, introduced by Barbara Goldberg. And please come back for our next Poets versus the Pandemic series on Wednesday, July 15, 2020, which will feature yours truly, Henry Crawford, reading from my new book, uh, The Binary Planet. Thanks again to our poets, Tracy Brimhall and Borgie Zenhuizen, and to our WordWorks leader, Karen Allenier, and for all of you for coming out tonight and spending some time uh, with poetry. Uh, stay safe and see you in the next show. So long. <laughs>